Welcome, friends and seekers, to the Gospel Inc. podcast, where ink meets inspiration and stories of faith come to life. I am your host, David Green, and while I'm not a preacher, I'm here to guide you on a refreshing journey through the pages of hope and salvation. Each week, we delve into different chapters of the Bible, unpacking the wisdom, uncovering the truths, and exploring the life-saving message within. Together, we will navigate the rich mosaic of God's Word, allowing it to illuminate our paths, enrich our spirits, and deepen our understanding of faith and life. Imagine navigating the complete life with the Bible as your compass, painting each day with the strokes of grace, love, and truth. Here at Gospel Inc., that is not just a dream. It is our shared journey. So why wait? Embark on an enlightening adventure with us. Let your spirit be stirred and your heart be filled with the warmth and ultimate truth. Stay tuned and stay blessed as we unfold Byron Hughes of the Gospel, only here on Gospel Inc. Welcome, dear listeners, to another episode of Gospel Inc. I'm your host, David Green, and I am so happy you're here with me today. So I want to start with this. Throughout the annals of time, humanity has dreamt of utopias, perfect places where sorrow, pain, and chaos give way to peace, joy, and unending harmony. Today, we delve deep into the scripture that unveils not just a human dream, but a divine promise. Revelations 21 beckons us to peer into the very heart of God's future for his people painting a portrait of a city so radiant, so pure, and so filled with glory of God that it leaves us in awe. As we journey through this chapter, let us allow our hearts to be captivated by the celestial vision, recognizing that this isn't just a distant reality, but a promise for all who believe. So grab your Bibles, or just lend me your ears, as we embark on the exploration of the New Jerusalem, the culmination of God's redemptive plan for humanity. First, we're going to start in verses 1 through 4. This is the new heaven and the new earth. Here is what it says. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. It's beautiful. And what we're seeing here is creation renewed. The vision begins with the emergence of a new heaven and a new earth. The previous creation, marred by sin and death, has passed away. The absence of the sea, often associated with chaos and disorder in ancient literature, suggests a creation free from turmoil. The holy city, the New Jerusalem, described as a bride, indicating an intimate relationship between God and his people. The city is not just a physical place, but a symbol of God's everlasting covenant, love, and promise for his people. What we're seeing here is the new Garden of Eden. Then next we see God's presence. The voice from the throne declares the reunification of God with humanity. The narrative has come full circle from the Garden of Eden, where man walked with God, to a restored creation where God dwells among his people once more. Then we see the end of suffering. One of the most profound promises in these verses is the end of pain, the end of mourning, and the end of death. God himself will wipe away every single tear, indicating a deep and personal connection and compassion. It's a glimpse of a future free from the effects of sin and death, because sin and death is no more. So here are my takeaways, right? First, as Christians, we have hope in renewal. The promise of a new heaven and a new earth gives believers hope. In the face of environmental degradation, social upheaval, personal tragedies, war, any other awful thing you can think of, we are reminded that God has a plan for renewal and restoration. Then we see the relationship between God and man restored. The New Jerusalem coming down emphasizes that God takes the initiative in restoring the broken relationship with humanity. It's not about our efforts to reach up to him, but his love reaching down to us. Then we see the end of all pain. For anyone who has suffered, The promise that God will end all pain and wipe away every tear is incredibly comforting. It reminds us that our present sufferings are temporary in light of the eternal joy and peace God will grant believers. Then the anticipating the eternity. 
As believers, these verses should shape our worldview and daily lives. While we navigate the challenges of today, our ultimate hope lies in eternal promises of God's presence in a world renewed by Him. To just summarize, right, verses 1 through 4, the new heaven and the new earth represents God's ultimate victory over sin and death. This glorious renewal offers believers hope, comfort, and fresh perspective on the transient nature of our current struggles. The future is bright because God is making all things new, reaffirming his eternal love and commitment to his people. Next, we're going to move down to verse 5. This talks about the throne of God and the Lamb. Here's what it says. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said this, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So what we're seeing here is divine declaration. The one seated on the throne is undoubtedly God, the almighty creator. His pronouncement, Behold, I am making all things new, is not just about physical renewal but a holistic transformation that encompasses spiritual, emotional, and relational dimensions. Then he gives John a command to record. God instructs John to write down his words, emphasizing their utmost importance. This directive suggests that God's promises are unchanging and meant to be a lasting testament for all generations. Then he says they are trustworthy and true. The affirmation that God's words are both trustworthy and true reinforces the certainty of his promises. In a world filled with uncertainty, shifting truths, and broken promises, God's word stands firm and unshakable. So here are my takeaways. First, we have unwavering hope. God's commitment to making all things new provides a foundation of hope for believers. Regardless of the decay, the decline, or the despair we might witness around us, God has a plan for complete restoration. And then what we see is the weight of God's word. Being instructed to write down God's words reminds believers of the significance and weight of the scripture. It's not just ancient text, but the living word of God relevant for guidance, comfort, and instruction, even today and for future future generations. And then the reliable promise. In times of doubt or uncertainties, believers can find solace in the fact that God's words are trustworthy and true. His promises are not whimsical or fleeting, but steadfast and eternal. To summarize verse 5, what I think is this verse highlights God's sovereign power and unwavering commitment to renewal. As believers, we are called to cling to the trustworthy and true promises of God, allowing them to shape our perspectives, drive our hope, and guide our actions in a world that desperately needs the eternal hope only He can provide us. Next, we're going to move down to verses 6 through 8. I call this the source of life and the end of suffering. Here's what it says. And He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning in the end, to the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, adulterers, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So we see is a divine assertion. God declaration, it is done, signifies the culmination of his redemptive plan. He introduces himself as the Alpha Alpha and Omega, reinforcing his eternal nature, and that he encompasses all of history from beginning to end. And then we see the water of life. God offers the water of life to those who thirst is symbolic of spiritual sustenance and eternal life. This is given freely, underscoring the ideal that salvation cannot be earned, but is a gracious gift from God. Then the promise of heritage, right? Those who overcome or conquer by maintaining their faith in Christ are assured of their eternal heritage with God. This mutual relationship is emphasized through the phrase, I will be his God and he will be my son. But wrapping this up, right? He has a warning of judgment. The passage doesn't shy away from mentioning the consequences of unrepented sin. The list of those who will experience the second death serves as a solemn reminder of God's justice and the gravity of rejecting him. But here are some important words I want to highlight in this verse. First, the one who conquers. Throughout the letter to the seven churches in Revelations 2 and 3, the phrase to the one who conquers, or variations of it, appears repeatedly. 
in the context of Revelations and the broader New Testament, to conquer or to overcome refers to believers who remain faithful to Christ amid persecution, temptation, and challenges of life in a fallen world. It's about a spiritual victory over the forces that oppose God and his people. Next, we'll have this heritage. This heritage or inheritance in some translations refers to the blessings and promises that God has reserved for his people in the new heavens and the new earth. This includes eternal life, a world free from pain and sorrow, and intimate communion with God. And lastly, I want to highlight this. I will be his God and he will be my son. This promise echoes covenants from the Old Testament where God often says to his people, I will be their God and they will be my people. By extending the promise to he will be my son, there's an intimate family relationship highlighted. Believers are not just subjects in God's kingdom. They are cherished children of God's family. So here are my takeaways. First, we see the completeness of God's plan. God's word, it is done, should infuse believers with confidence in the completeness and perfection of God's salvation plan. Nothing remains unfinished in his divine agenda. Next, we see God's unending grace. The free gift of the water of life demonstrates God's immense love and generosity towards humanity. It is a call for everyone, regardless of their past, to come and partake in God's gift of salvation. Next, the responsibility and the reward. The passage strikes a balance between promise and warning. While it provides assurance of a blessed eternity for believers, it also underscores the importance of faithfulness and the real consequences of continued rebellion against our God. So to summarize this, right, verses 6 through 8, these verses juxtapose God's boundless grace with his unwavering justice. While he generously offers the gift of eternal life, there are consequences for those who reject him. As believers, it serves as a motivation to preserve our faith and to share the gospel message, emphasizing that both the hope of salvation and the gravity of eternal separation from God. Next, we're going to move down from, to verses 9 through 14 titled The New Jerusalem and the Bride of the Lamb. Here is what it said. Then come one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and its radiance like the most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of this city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. All right, so what we see here, right? The angel's invitation. An angel, previously involved in pouring out judgments, now guides John to a different vision, a vision of hope beauty, and restoration. This shift from judgment to restoration encapsulates the dual nature of God as just and merciful. Next, we see the bride's splendor. The new Jerusalem presented as the bride represents the collective body of believers in Christ. Its descent from heaven indicates a divine origin and purity. Described in radiant terms, the city reflects the glory of God, showcasing his majesty and splendor. Then we see the city's fortifications. The high walls signify protection and sanctity. The presence of the 12 gates with angels emphasize order, access, and security. The description of the names of the 12 tribes symbolize continuity of God's promise to Israel. Then we see the foundations of the apostles. The mention of the 12 apostles as the city's foundation indicates the crucial role they played in establishing the early Christian church. It's a testament to the unity of God's covenant people, both from the Old and the New Testament. So here are my takeaways, right? Transition from wrath to restoration. This vision gives, given to John moves from scene of judgment to the reward and restoration. It's a beautiful reminder that after trials and tribulations, God's ultimate plan is one of restoration and communion with his people. And we see the unity of God's people. The description of both the tribes of Israel and the apostles symbolize the comprehensive nature of God's salvation plan, uniting the both the old and the new covenant believers. And then we see the divine security. The detailed description of the New Jerusalem fortification assures believers of their safety and eternal security in God's presence. The heavenly city is not only a place of beauty, but also a place of peace. Then we see the magnificence of God's glory. The radiance of the city serves as a tangible reflection of God's glory. For believers, it's an anticipation of the grandeur and beauty that await them in eternity. 
To summarize verses 9 through 14, these verses uh, offer a breathtaking glimpse into the New Jerusalem, highlighting its divine origin, protection, and the unified body of believers. It serves as a beacon of hope for Christians, reminding them of their glorious future and the eternal rewards that surpass anything the earth can give you or that you can receive in the earth. Next, we're going to move down to uh, verses 15 through 21, the dimensions and the beauty of New Jerusalem. Here's what it says. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square. It's linked the same as its width. And it, he measured the city with a rod, 12,000 stadia. It's length and width and height are equal. He also measured its walls, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third gate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysopress, the eleventh janiseth, the twelfth amherst. So what we're seeing here is the measurement of the city. The act of measuring signifies precision, order, and purpose. Using a gold measuring rod, the angel provides specific dimensions of New Jerusalem, emphasizing its grandeur and divine design. So the New Jerusalem, as described, would be a cube, with each side measuring about 1,380 miles in length, width, and height. So let's provide some perspective here. A length of 1,380 miles would span a significant portion of a continent. For instance, in the U.S., it was stretched from the East Coast to beyond the Mississippi River. And a height of 1,380 miles would extend far beyond the Earth's atmosphere, right into space. But we also see here, right, is perfect symmetry. The city is described as foursquare, with its length, width, and height being equal. This is perfect symmetry, uh, symbolizes completeness and perfection in God's design. Then we see sublime materials. The use of precious stones and metals like jasper, gold, and a multitude of other jewels represent the unmatched splendor and purity of the city. The city's gold likeness to clear glass emphasizes its untainted and radiant nature. Then we see the foundations adorned. The 12 foundations, each represented by a distinct jewel, not only add to the city's aesthetic beauty, but may also symbolize various truths or attributes of the kingdom of God. So here are my takeaways. First, what we see in this design is God's attention to detail. The meticulous measurements and detailed descriptions reveals God's attention to detail, reinforcing that everything in his kingdom is purposeful and perfectly designed. Then we see the eternal beauty and purity. The radiant materials and precious stones employed in the construction of the city serve as a reminder of the eternal beauty and purity that await believers. Then we see the symbolic foundations, the adorned foundations, each with a unique jewel can be a reminder of the diversity, yet unity, in the kingdom of God. Each stone might represent different attributes, blessings, or promises of God, reflecting the richness of his eternal kingdom. So in summary, right, verses 15 through 21 paint a vivid picture of the New Jerusalem's magnificent design, emphasizing its grandeur, beauty, and divine perfection. For believers, it's a glimpse into the glorious inheritance awaiting them, crafted by God in unmatched artistry and purpose. It serves as an encouragement to look forward to the eternity where beauty, purity, and God's perfect design are realized in its fullness. Next, we're going to move down to verses 22 through 27. I call it the Temple of City and the Lamb of Light. And here's what it says. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord, God and Almighty, and the Lamb. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamps is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So what we see here is the absence of a temple. In ancient cities, temples were central to worship and religious activities. The absence of a temple in the New Jerusalem emphasizes God's direct and unhindered presence with his people. The need for a symbolic structure vanishes as God himself and the Lamb are in the city's centerpiece. Then we see God's radiant glory. The city doesn't require natural sources of light, like the sun or moon. The omnipresence, the radiant glory of God, illuminates it, signifying its unpar unparalleled majesty and the Lamb's redemptive role. Then we see nations and kings. The reference to nations and kings signifies the universality of God's kingdom. 
leaders, and people from all nations will recognize and honor the supremacy of God, indicating the universal acknowledgement of his sovereignty. Then we see open gates and eternal day. The perpetually open gates of the city symbolize its welcoming nature, while the absence of night underscores the enduring nature of God's presence and glory. And lastly, we see the sanctity of the city. The New Jerusalem is a place of purity and righteousness. Only those whose names are inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life, representing the redeemed, will enter it, emphasizing the importance of genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So here are my takeaways. First, we see the direct communion with God. The absence of the temple underscores the privilege uh, believers will have in enjoying direct communion with God, emphasizing a restored relationship that echoes Adam and Eve. Then we see the unfading light of God. The city's illumination by God's glory offers believers the hope of an attorney free from darkness, both literally and metaphorically. Then we see universal worship. The gathering of nations and their leaders to honor God showcases the universal worship and acknowledgement of God's majesty, offering a glimpse of harmonious global unity. And lastly, we see eternal security and purity. The open gates and the selectiveness of the interest highlight both the city's inviting nature and its commitment to purity. So to summarize, right, verses 22 through 27, these verses offer a portrait of the New Jerusalem as a city marked by God's direct presence, his radiant glory, and an atmosphere of universal worship. It encapsulates the hope of eternal communion with God, unhindered by worship, and the joy of dwelling in a place of unparalleled beauty, sanctity, and peace. So as we draw to a close on today's journey through Revelations 21, let's pause and reflect. This celestial city, the New Jerusalem, isn't just an ethereal concept or a poetic metaphor. It is a promise, a promise of a future where every tear will be wiped away, where the former things have passed and all things are made anew. But dear listeners, the beauty of this promise is not just in its grandeur or splendor, but in its accessibility. The gates of the city are open, welcoming all who have embraced the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Every story we cherish has a beginning and an end. Our lives too, our stories written on the canvas of time. And while there may be chapters of pain, of loss, and uncertainty, let the promise of the New Jerusalem be a beacon of hope that illuminates your path, reminding you that the final chapter for those who believe is one of eternal joy, peace, and communion with God. So as you step out into your coming days, let the vision of this holy city embolden your faith, inspire your actions, and anchor your hope. For in the words of the Apostle Paul, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of a man imagined, God has prepared for those who love him. Thank you for joining me today on Gospel Inc. My, may your hearts be inked with everlasting gospel, and may your shine as a light, reflecting the promise of the glorious city. Until next time, stay blessed and keep the faith. Today, as we delve deeply into the chapter of the Bible, let our hearts be tuned to the resounding echoes of divine truth and hope that transcends the ages and whispers fervently to our spirits every day. In the swirling torments of time, marked by uncertainty and confusion and the shadows of persecution, let us anchor ourselves in the unshakable reality of Christ's sovereignty. He reigns supreme, his authority is unyielding, and his love is unfailing. Remember, he is the triumphant king who holds the keys to life and death, whose resurrected power pulses in our veins of creation, promising us victory over the grave and the gift of eternal life. As we tread the pages that unfold the visions granted to John on the rugged terrain of island of Potmos, let us not forget the context of this revelation. Potmos, a place of isolation and exile, mirrors the depths and despair and abandonment. Yet, it is here amid the barren landscape that the radiant light of God presence peace it pierces the veil of darkness, illuminating the path of hope, assurance, and eternal promises. Here it states, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the key to death and Hades. In the face of towering empires and oppressive rulers, John, the apostle of love, received the unyielding words of Christ, a message of flame with resolute courage and unyielding victory. These wars breathe life and resilience into the fledging Christian community, battered by the tempts and persecution and fear of the overarching empire. But here he says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written. 
because the time is near. Let this blessing permeate our very beings, infusing us with the strength and fortitude as we navigate the pathway of our lives. May the profound words and visions of revelations fill our spirits with unwavering assurance in Christ's ultimate victory and eternal reign. In the mosaic of divine revelations, may we glimpse the celestial tapestry of God's unending love and faithfulness. As we close this reflection, let us carry forth the flame of hope ignited by the resplendent visions of John, allowing its light to guide our steps, dispel our fears, and deepen our unwavering allegiance to our risen Lord. I pray that our hearts may ever be strengthened, our spirits ever emboldened, and our lives ever anchored in the boundless ocean of God's eternal paradise. In precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I say amen. I want to close today with a simple prayer. If you would, please close your eyes and bow your head with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins today, and I invite you to come into my heart and come into my life. I want to trust you and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, remember, saying this prayer or any other prayer will not save you by itself. It is the genuine faith and conviction in your heart that God cares about you. The words are simply a way for you to express your faith and commitment to God. The true salvation experience comes from truly believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, feeling remorse for your sins, and living a life that shows commitment to following His teachings. Now, I want to thank you, right? Thank you for following with me today, for listening to my words. If you found my content of value, I invite you to click the subscribe button. Over the next few weeks, our journey will further unfold into the chapters of Revelations. Your insights are important to me. If there's anything you disagree with or would like to share feedback on, please don't hesitate to leave me a comment. In future episodes, I plan to review comments on the podcast because engaging discussion often leads to deeper understanding. And perhaps God has granted you insight into his divine promises that could enlighten us all. Wishing you a blessed and joyful week.